Okay, does this work? Yeah. Okay, so thank you for coming. I uh, just not working. Ah, we have to. Okay, that's why it's okay. That's going to be to be painful, but uh, okay, never mind. Um, so thank you for coming. Uh, just a quick show of hands. Uh, who in the room is a Debian contributor, Debian maintainer, or Debian developer? Okay, and who is a Debian user? Okay. <laughs> so I'm the current Debian project leader. This talk is not spec. It, it, it works? Okay. So you have uh, some <laughs> duct tape. <laughs> Okay, so uh, I'm the Debian project leader. This talk is not specifically about Debian. I hope that even if you're not involved in Debian in any way, it will be interesting to you. Uh, under the title, I briefly considered when submitting the talk back in December, but I rejected, was this. Uh, <laughs> 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 but the truth about this talk is really that it's about hard problems I would like someone to solve. So I'm just. Showing my, trying to share my to-do list. So it started when I saw this quote from uh, Matthew Miller. And the problems that these are trying to solve a decade ago largely are seen as not only solved, but kind of boring. And so it was featured in LWN a few months ago. And I started thinking, and I was thinking, okay, which problems should, should, we, should we try to solve today as distributions? So let's, let's first step, take a step back and look at what distributions are uh, in the free software world. So there are many upstream projects, different kind of upstream projects as well. Uh, some of them developing one big piece of software, other developing uh, closely related uh, smaller pieces of software. Uh, some of them uh, developing collections of software. And we have users. And in the middle, we have distributions like Debian. And what distributions do is take software from upstream projects and push it to users uh, in the form of transform it and push it to users in the form of packages. And uh, in the other direction, uh, distributions get feedback and bugs from users and tend to forward it to upstream projects. But sometimes the picture is uh, more complicated because we have some distributions, some distributions with web derivatives like Debian uh, and Tails and uh, Ubuntu. And some distributions even have their own derivatives, which has their own derivative or users. So what do uh, distribution, what's the, what's the role of distribution in the free software world? So what we do well is we provide a unified interface uh, for users to upstream projects, <coughs> like package, using package managers and upstream uh, and mirror networks to hide all the subtle uh, differences between between each upstream project. And in some case, we end up replacing upstream projects completely. We also integrate upstream projects, resolving all incompatibilities between them. And we kind of uh, end up cleaning free software uh, from problems that upstreams often ignore. We are, distributions are a kind of big washing machine where uh, we put upstream projects and they uh, end up cleaner without, uh, with many issues such as uh, uh, um, uh, ABI compatibility, legal issues uh, removed. There are things we don't do uh, that well, uh, and I spoke about that in, uh, in my talk. Uh, provide an intermediate support layer, uh, act as mediators uh, between upstreams, derivatives, and users, and meet all our users' needs. So, can we do better about all of that? First, about meeting all our users' needs. So, quick poll, who is in the room during the last year had to install something from sources using unofficial packages, gems, or CPAN, or whatever? Okay. There's a lot of uh, software that is not packaged, and we are losing the race. So, these graphs from uh, uh, modules, modulecounts.com shows the number of packages in uh, various uh, well, language-specific repositories. And uh, so Debian Jesse, which is going to be released soon, has 21,000 source packages, so that's that line. So clearly, there's a lot of software that is not packaged in distributions. But of also often, not the version you need in the release you are using, or in backports. Uh, so in Debian, we have uh, backports, 
uh, we have currently uh, 974 packages in with the backports, 21,000 uh, in Jesse. So if you end up, well, if you end up being able to use uh, a specific package from backports, we're actually quite lucky. So uh, how can we aim, sorry, word missing, for 100% coverage of our users' needs? And I think there are two uh, parts to this question. First one is get more efficient at packaging and providing additional levels of support. So first, one slide about distribution contributors. Uh, with distribution contributors tend to be more uh, DevOps than pure developers. Most of them, especially in volunteer projects, started by scratching a niche, which is easing the installation of software they need. And actually that's a need that is very frequent among sysadmins, but not so much uh, for developers. So we end up, we have a community that is excellent at uh, dealing with uh, obscure, dirty, unique stuff in various languages, like build system, etc., and for, for forcing various things into working together. But we end up also with a community which is not necessarily not so great at designing and writing complex frameworks. So people who like to do that kind of work tend to go to um, uh, other projects. And also we tend to, uh, we have a tendency to act uh, using, like sysadmins, using uh, uh, adding layers of glue to get things to work together uh, and to avoid deep refactoring because that's not usually what sysadmin does. They need just like to take things together. And that's also why, why it's harder to recruit compared to other projects because that mix of sysadmining skills and development skills that we need in distributions is actually something that you cannot find, well, you don't find in typical university curriculum. So I teach at university, both in sysadmin uh, sys oriented courses and uh, development oriented courses, but those are generally very different uh, sets of students. And finding someone with both skills is really difficult, especially some, uh, someone young, because most of, usually they, one side is learned through uh, education, the other one through experience, and finding someone who learned both early, it's quite, it's quite hard. So let, let's look at the uh, Debian packaging stack. At the bottom of it, we have uh, dpkg dev and shell commands like install. On top of that, uh, we introduced an abstraction layer called developer with all those dh underscore something uh, commands. On top of that, so uh, that with developer uh, alone resulted in packages that were, uh, that shared a lot of um, similar code uh, between, between uh, yeah. And so we decided to add abstraction layers. The first one was CDBS, which was introduced in 2003. Uh, and there was another one introduced in 2008, DH. Uh, on top of that, there are tools like DH Maple, Python SPDEB, Gen2Deb, npm 2 deb or Cabal Debian. Cabal Debian is the one for as well. Most of them are now based uh, on top of DH. I'm not sure if there's still some of them based on top of CDBS. And uh, on top of that, we have tools like uh, Git Build Package, SVN Build Package, Git that are actually used uh, to, what are more, so not really about packaging code, but about uh, uh, maintenance of the packaging code. So there are several problems with that, with, that, with that stack. The first one is that we are not really moving away from deprecated tool. Uh, when CDBS was introduced in 2008, it was uh, often seen as a CDBS killer. People didn't, did not like CDBS for various reasons. So they hoped that uh, DH would, would just kill CDBS. And that did, did not happen at all, actually. So in that graph, the, um, okay, the red line here is uh, the number of packages in Debian using developer. The green line here is the number of packages using CDBS. And the blue line here is the number of packages using DH. So what DH managed to do is actually uh, um, well, uh, it made maintainers, move, made maintainers move away from developer, but not from CDBS. There's still about the same number of packages using CDBS than in 2010. Yeah. 
Sure, okay. <laughs> yeah, but I think that if you ask uh, Debian developers, most of them would agree with you and think that uh, it should be deprecated. Okay, who in the room is a Debian developer and does not think that CDBS should probably be deprecated? <laughs> okay. <laughs> yeah. We are, we are also not hiding lower level tools. Um, so those are slides from uh, Joey S. talk about uh, developer in, at DevConf9, where I introduced developer. So he made the point that uh, the, surface, the visible surface area of developer was this, 138 items. The visible, uh, and CDBS added 153 items to that, which was one of the reasons why people thought that CDBS were not, was not such a great idea. And he made the point that uh, DH was only adding 12 items. But the thing is, it's 12 plus 138. We did not simplify uh, the interface that people have to learn to do packaging. Uh, we just added a layer on top of it and required people to know both developer and DH. So when you look at, uh, at uh, this graph and wonder, uh, what people need to master, to need, need to know, what you need to master to do Debian packaging? The answer is all of it, actually. <laughs> the third problem is that uh, we are not good at maintaining our packaging code. So packaging code uh, is uh, influenced, so pack by packaging code, I mean everything in the Debian directory, so uh, both um, description of packages and uh, Debian rules files that uh, describe how packages are built. And this code uh, is influenced by changes in the upstream code, like there's a new upstream version that does things differently, so you need to uh, change your packaging code. Uh, changes in the Debian policy and changing in the, in the packaging team's uh, policy and practices, because each team tends to have its own way to do packaging, and sometimes there are changes uh, in a specific team that need to be pushed to all uh, packages. So packaging is kind of manual merging of those three different branches. And we do that all the time, and we have tools for some of it. For example, for upstream code, we have uh, you update. But we don't really have tools for uh, changes. We don't have tools for changing in, in Debian policy. There are some teams that have uh, ad, hoc tool to, ad hoc tools to push one specific change to all packages uh, in the team. It's quite easy to, to write a script that just uh, replace something by something else in all of the team's packages. So we end up with uh, a lot of duplication is in our uh, about 3,000 Perl modules or 700 Python libs. We also have a lot of outdated packaging code because this manual mer merging is not really easy to do. Uh, yeah, and that's sort of packaging code. So what should we do? So is Enrico Zini in the room? Actually, I was wondering. No, okay. So, oops. So we should design a higher level packaging framework. <laughs> Probably. <laughs> and uh, actually, there was one discussed at DevConf called DevDry by Enrico Zini. That's why I asked if he's in the room. And when DevDry is run, uh, what it does, that's from the DevDry documentation. So it moves the content of your Debian directory aside. It chooses uh, and runs an automatic Debianization tool, for example, DH make, DH make Perl. It applies your manual changes on top of the auto-generated auto Debian directory to produce final source package. And it stores the original di Debian directory in Debian dev drive so that the process can be reversed. So in a sense, your packaging code became, becomes the output of DH make Perl or DH make Ruby or whatever tool is specific to your kind of package plus the diff of Debian for all the manual changes that you made on top of that. So I think that's, that's clearly a step in the right, di the right direction to use uh, the output of uh, a standard tool, higher level standard tool, uh, as a basis for uh, the packaging work. But still, the maintainer is still editing files in Debian uh, after dhmakeperl or dhmakeruby is run. So it's still uh, low level. Uh, the diffing and patching might fail in some cases. For example, uh, if you have uh, 
um, new uh, packages uh, replacing old packaging with a different name. And it's yet another tool. It's, uh, it would uh, make the higher, uh, higher entry barrier. So it means on that graph, it would be something there on top of the, those two. So what we should really uh, look at is uh, look at how to um, design a tool that relies on our known working tools and formats like developer, but hide them in 99% uh, of cases. If you think at um, uh, programming languages, uh, in the, if you want to learn C, you don't need to learn assembly first. And that's actually what kind of what we are doing. If you want to learn uh, packaging Perl packages, you don't need. Uh, and to learn, uh, you shouldn't need to learn uh, developer first. So it should be something like a compiler or generator for the Debian directory. And if we do that, it means that we get to spend less time on growing pure packaging stuff, more time on hard and testing problems. We would lower the entry barrier for newcomers. We would automate the packaging work because be able to move more common tasks uh, in the packaging framework. And finally, it would not prevent any news uh, because it would still be possible for, uh, for bug fixes. So the any news uh, is uh, the, Debi uh, the Debian process for uh, non, the name, Debian name for non-maintainer uploads. That's when uh, someone, not the maintainer of the package, wants to make a change to, to a package. And because you could still work from the generated files using the well-known tools uh, to, uh, to patch, uh, patch some bug in the package. So if we, if we look specifically at automating the packaging work, uh, what could it bring? Uh, so we could have uh, automated backports, uh, too stable for most of, most of testing and, and stable and experimental. We could have automated packages uh, for, C for repositories like CPAN, PyPy, RubyGems, Maven Central, or NPM. Of course, if we do that, uh, we don't provide the same level of support as, with, as, as for the packages that are uh, really uh, part of Debian. Uh, we, pro we would not be able to provide security support for them, no manual testing, but we are getting quite good at uh, automated testing. And this is something that, is, that should be still be an improvement compared to the current state of things where you have to uh, install stuff manually using third-party tools. So if we manage to do something like that, it means that uh, distribution packages, so DEB or RPM files, uh, become again the universal way to manage software, which, which, is, which is no longer the case today. And we end up packaging, being able to package most of the free software world including every version of it, because uh, it, not, it would be um, quite cheap to just instan instantiate that for every version available on various repositories, which is something that our users need because they end up installing something, some, a lot of stuff from, from source. Uh, so this was actually, uh, yeah, so first this was actually discussed on the Debian mailing list uh, over the last two weeks. Uh, so there's a, a few additional pointers in, the, in that thread. Uh, and one, uh, of course, uh, difficult problem to deal with uh, about providing automated packages is the uh, legal side of this. But if you think about it, uh, CPAN and our RubyGems are doing it already. So probably we can find a way to uh, do it as well. So I also, also would like to talk about uh, other challenges, which are a bit less technical. So the first one is uh, applications and services versus packages. So what users want uh, typically is working applications and services that they can install on their machines. And what we provide uh, is working packages, and actually that's quite a difference between uh, those two things. For simple application services, it's not, really, it's not really a problem. We have a clear mapping between packages and applications. But for complex services that actually require interactions between various packages, it's, it's not so obvious. For example, uh, you cannot app get install a mail server. Okay, you can app get install Exim, for example, but not a mail server with uh, uh, 
uh, spam filtering plus your IMAP server, etc. Uh, you cannot app install your cloud your cloud infra infra infrastructure. Well, it quite works in Debian with OpenStack, but it's not quite there yet. Our web application using complex stack. We are kind of uh, behind uh, on web application packaging. Uh, and that's uh, a very important problem to be able to uh, ena to enable users to keep controlling their computing. Uh, we have users uh, using uh, the cloud typically because it's too hard. Uh, you, you have users in Gmail because it's too hard to install your own ma your own mail server. And that's actually a big a big failure, uh, probably of uh, uh, most of the free software community for not being able to make it uh, uh, easy, easier to install mail servers uh, or web applications. So there was a great talk from uh, Stefano Zaccheroli at DevConf uh, about uh, that uh, specific problem. Uh, so you might want to, to watch it. Uh, so one thing that makes it hard to, uh, uh, to package applic complex application services is that uh, but the technical issue is that um, packages that configure other packages is hard. Uh, how to do that is uh, hinted in the Debian policy. But really, uh, working with that, if you think about uh, web applications and uh, 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 databases, for example, uh, or web servers, it's quite hard to get it right. So we should look at uh, uh, all the things happening in configuration management and containers, which are, which are really popular uh, topics currently. And I think that, well, you are probably all familiar with um, uh, Richard Salman uh, analogy between, between free software uh, and cooking recipes. And there's a kind of similar analogy about um, uh, packages and uh, cooking recipes. Packages are, in the case of uh, complex uh, services, are kind of ingredients, not really the cooking recipe itself. So we could ask ourselves whether we should, we should package cooking recipes, which would mean, for example, packaging puppet or, puppet or chef uh, recipes that would automate the configuration of set of packages. We could do that. Maybe we should uh, ship fully prepared meals. It would be containers with everything installed and configured that just work. But if we do that, that's not really uh, a perfect form for making modification. If you get, so you get something, you don't, don't know exactly how it was uh, configured. And also, if we do that, it's going to be hard to, uh, to, com to combine uh, different, uh, it's going to be hard to combine different services or different applications on the same machine, which is also something that is important. That's why it was all you can eat buffet. Uh, so maybe we should uh, think hard about it and uh, uh, help users uh, install complex application services by thinking by, by inventing something that would be in the middle between uh, packages, uh, containers, the tasks. Tasks are sets of packages, so you can add, uh, add get install uh, a fully working desktop, for example, uh, or blends. And I think that there's maybe something there that uh, distributions would be in the uh, right position to, to look at, to fix that issue of uh, uh, people moving away from distributions to, uh, uh, move to, to run the uh, mail infrastructure, for example. So, yeah, a lot of um, uh, computing today is moving to new architectures, smartphones and tablets. Uh, currently, you can run Debian in foot, so uh, uh, in some cases using bind mounts. Uh, cloud infrastructure as well. Uh, the current status is that you can run, you can, uh, there are semi-official uh, images for several public clouds. And it's actually a similar situation. It's about users uh, giving, up, giving, giving up their freedom, control, and trust in action of comfort. It's easier. You give up your freedom, control, and trust when you choose to use uh, a non-free uh, smartphone platform or cloud or public cloud infrastructure. So the question we should ask uh, here is, uh, can we help users regain those uh, freedom, control, and trust without losing the comfort? And 
the question where I have no answer is uh, what could we bring with a Debian powered smartphone or tablet? What's the uh, additional values that distribution could provide in that uh, uh, non-free uh, smartphone platforms would never be able to provide? Also, um, there's a question of uh, semi-official images in clouds. Uh, how much should we work uh, with public clouds to provide um, uh, uh, official images or, well, Debian, uh, Debian vetted images uh, in those environments? And on how can we uh, enforce the quality of those images? How, how do we make sure that, uh, say, uh, the quality of official so for Amazon, the situation is, is not is quite good, so I'm using Amazon as an example. How, do, how can we make sure that, uh, the, that the Debian images on Amazon are actually of a suitable quality? And maybe we should uh, work on a certification kit for cloud providers to help them <coughs> improve on that. I'd like to talk to also about increasing trust in distributions. So, as you know, uh, well, security issues have been have had a lot of focus within the last uh, months, or probably you know <laughs> about it. And you, our users are actually putting a lot of trust in us. In us, uh, users are just blindly running our binaries and maintainer scripts. Uh, and are we really that trustworthy? Uh, that's not so. Yes, we are. <laughs> Okay. <laughs> so we are quite good at uh, providing a trustable package manager and an archive. I think that uh, many people have looked at that. Uh, what's yeah? That's <laughs> okay. About development process, quite. Um, we only have <laughs> twenty-five percent of packages. Uh, not maintained using a VCS. Yeah, so one could argue that's probably not the 25 most important packages that are in that case. I did not uh, <laughs> compute it compared to Popcorn or something. <laughs> uh, we also only have 5% modifying uh, upstream sources without using a patch system. So just to explain that, uh, so in Debian we have uh, um, so in Debian, when, where, when, you, when the maintainer needs to modify the upstream source, uh, the recommended practice is to use a patch system, which means that each change to the upstream source is separated in a different patch uh, with, with, with a description. And uh, those 5% of packages are just uh, actually providing a single big patch with all the changes, which is not quite good for auditing what was changed. About trustable packages. So one of the Debian's dust, dirtiest secrets, not so many people know actually outside Debian. <laughs> yeah, that's one way to make it uh, go away, <laughs> you know, talk about it. <laughs> Is that packages built by developers are used in the archive, which means that if you are using a package uh, um, I maintain, and uh, you, are you are using the same architecture as the one I'm building packages for, for example, AMD64, the package you are, you are installing on your machine is actually the one I built on my laptop and uploaded. It's not getting rebuilt in the Debian infrastructure. W we did not know about that? Okay. <laughs> so, there's some work for that because it's, not, it's no longer completely true. Source only uploads, which means uploading only the source and gets rebuilt in the Debian infrastructure are not possible, but not mandatory yet. Uh, also, it's not working for architecture all packages yet. Architecture all packages, uh, packages like Perl libraries that, not, that don't need to be rebuilt on every, on every Debian architecture. The same package works everywhere. So there's some work to do here because it's actually, this is actually quite scary. But we have a solution actually, or pa a partial solution to that. Uh, there's a great project called uh, Reproducible Builds. Uh, and one of the goals of, rep of reproduci Reproducible Builds is to provide auditability via a uh, bit for bit comparison. So the idea is to take the package that is in the archive, 
rebuild it and see if you get the exact same package. If you do, it means that even if the package was uploaded by the maintainer, it doesn't really matter because if you have if you had rebuilt it in the uh, inf infrastructure, it would be exactly the same package. Uh, it's also well having that already is also uh, uh, a good step in the right direction because it means that if a maintainer thinks about uploading uploaded a, a uploading a package with a backdoor to the Debian infrastructure, it's likely it will be noticed at some point thanks to that work. So. Yeah. Yeah. Oh, okay. Go. Just go. Yeah. Uh, well, it would be. It w it's a way for people to make sure that Debian is doing the right thing. I mean, if uh, providing that means that uh, you don't need to trust Debian anymore, you can just make sure that uh, if you were to, uh, if you want to check what Debian did, you can audit the work Debian did there. Or uh, for derivative distribution, because everybody trusts Debian, but you might not trust uh, derivative distribution as much as, as, much, as much as Debian. No? Okay. Okay. So to do that, actually, if you think about it, it's quite it's really super hard. Uh, because uh, there, are, there are lots of things that get randomly changed in uh, packages during builds, like timestamps, uh, Etc. So there are uh, several solutions to that. There's a file used to record uh, versions uh, of all dependencies used to build the package. But also various tricks to deal with timestamps and randomness. And I'm not going to say too much about that because there's a talk today uh, at 4 p.m. Uh, by Olger Levzen, who is sitting here. So just go. Yeah, with, with Nana, yeah. <laughs> And finally, a trustable runtime environment. That's something uh, for which we don't do much or almost nothing at, the th at this time. Uh, distributions are in a really good place to um, help run uh, each application in a separate secure container so that you can isolate uh, applications from each other and make sure that uh, one uh, service that would get uh, hacked uh, does not result in the whole system getting hacked. That's especially interesting, interesting in the context of uh, uh, web applications. That's also something that, uh, well, there are lots of, there's some work uh, going on in that area in the context of web application and distributions should probably look at uh, following there. The last point is about uh, increasing the bandwidth to uh, upstreams and derivatives. That's uh, very important. To, uh, if, we, if we go back to the, um, the picture in the beginning with uh, uh, distributions, upstream projects, etc., uh, because uh, that's the way, that's our way to uh, improve free software as a whole and not just our distribution. So the current status is uh, the following: uh, in Debian, at least, we have some structured contact points for derivatives. We have the Debian derivatives front desk. Uh, that actively contacts the Debian derivatives to uh, uh, inform them about uh, everything available in Debian to make their lives uh, easier. Uh, we have some services to monitor new upstream versions. So maintainers of packages in Debian uh, can provide a Debian watch file that describes uh, how to watch for new upstream versions, so the, typically the website of the upstream project. And uh, we have services uh, in the Debian infrastructure that uh, fetch those file and then uh, uh, go well go web browsing uh, the upstream web pages and notify the maintainer when a new version appears. Uh, there's some manual forwarding of bugs uh, happening. Uh, there are uh, some services uh, to track bugs in uh, other bug trackers. So Launchpad uh, has one, has, has this capability, so you can uh, link one bug to uh, other uh, bug trackers. In Debian, there's a tool called BTS Link. Um, there are some attempts, so BTS Link, I thought it was dead actually, and I've seen commits, uh, so apparently it's still working. I don't know if uh, anybody is uh, maintaining or uh, using it currently. No? Okay, so you are using it, it works. Yeah, okay, yeah. 
So maybe, so it's probably a lack of advertising because, uh, yeah. <laughs> um, there are some attempts at facilitating the exchange of patches between projects. So for example, uh, something Ubuntu, what that Ubuntu does and that is quite nice is that uh, the last change log, change log entry for packages that uh, diverge from Debian summarizes all the changes that were made to the Debian package. So in a few lines, you know uh, what were the changes in the, on the Ubuntu side. So uh, Debian uh, has a patch tagging guidelines document that explains how to tag uh, each, to, or to, yeah, to annotate each, ta uh, each patch with uh, standard headers. Uh, I'm not sure actually how much this is followed. Uh, I would say we could use a automated, automated, more automated test to make sure that this is actually uh, uh, followed. We used to have a service that exposed uh, all uh, patches in Debian packages. Unfortunately, it, uh, so it was called patchtracker.debian.org. It's currently down. Uh, uh, there's no maintainer. If you're interested in uh, taking this over, probably get in touch uh, with uh, uh, Isami or the DSA team. Quite, but uh, if, if you want to point your uh, upstream author to a single page where it can, it can monitor to make sure that uh, it knows about everything happening, uh, on the Debian side, it's not so nice to point to uh, sources Debian net. But uh, I think there's a point in having something there. But uh, I agree that maybe one way to um, recreate it would be to create it, recreate it on top of sources Debian net. Yeah. And we have some pa some dashboards with pointers to other distributions. For example, if you go to a tracker Debian net, there's an Ubuntu box where you can check the status of your package in Ubuntu. So that's not working uh, very smoothly. There are many um, upstreams that actually complain that they never, er, never hear from the Debian maintainer. Uh, so if you talk to your upstream, well, first, if you, yeah, it's good to talk to your upstream and uh, make sure that uh, he, knows he, he or she knows what you are doing. And there are also many bugs and patches not forwarded. Uh, it depends on the distribution, but some distributions are pretty bad at forwarding uh, bug reported uh, against uh, their packages. So that's something where a lot of progress could be made. Uh, for example, I think that that's really typically a problem that could be addressed in a cross distribution way. Uh, it doesn't need to be uh, a Debian specific solution. Most of it uh, doesn't need to be a Debian specific solution. And it would be actually quite nice uh, if, we had a, if we had a way uh, to provide a cross distribution uh, dashboard uh, that uh, upstreams could use to monitor the status of uh, packages in all distributions that, uh, that uh, package their software. Uh, one problem here is that the, is the naming of packages uh, it's not necessarily the same uh, over different distributions, but that's not, that's not such a hard problem. It can be worked around or could work as a starter for all packages which have the same names. So to conclude, I talked about uh, several challenges, uh, scaling and automating our packaging practices and tools, bringing complex services and applications to users, uh, improve our support of new computing environments, increasing trust, and improving collaboration. So to answer the, the comments, I actually started that talk. I don't think that's boring. Uh, <laughs> there's a lot of interesting work to do uh, in these areas and other areas. But to be better, to uh, release Jesse first. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> Questions? <coughs> yeah. I mean, if I'm, if I'm, if I'm supposed to repeat, <laughs> you could as well come forward. <laughs>
Oh yeah, sure. Uh, well, yeah. Yeah, it looks. Yeah, if if we if we add such a, such a dashboard, could be could be cross this rule and makes it easier to uh, talk to the maintainer of your of the same package in uh, another distribution. That's something we don't do much. Yeah. Yeah, I'm not sure I heard the beginning of your point, but you said that the uh, uh, distribution maintainer should be on the upstream uh, developer's mailing list. Yeah, yeah. Th the thing is, when it, it works, this works well when, the, um, when it's about uh, uh, maintaining one big uh, piece of software. Uh, when you are looking at the, for example, at the Perl team with uh, 3,000 uh, Perl libraries, it's not so easy to actually uh, keep track in a manual way uh, of the development of uh, all um, uh, of, uh, all uh, libraries, packages in Debian. That's why I think that uh, yeah, m we should try to look at uh, more automated um, things uh, to to look at that. Uh, I think fresh meat is dead. I'm not sure. Yeah, <laughs> but yeah, it has been a while. But fresh meat was kind of that. Uh, well, I'm addressing part of the problem, but uh, yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I, I agree that uh, in an ideal world, uh, all patches and uh, distribution should be forwarded to upstream block trackers. The thing is, uh, in reality, we don't do it uh, that well. Uh, the same is true for derivatives. Uh, every patch uh, to an Ubuntu package that is relevant to Debian should be in a Debian bug. Uh, but that doesn't happen in reality. That's why I think that uh, uh, we need to look at other solutions uh, also to kind of replace uh, that kind of things. And if you, from the upstream maintainer point of view, uh, if you have something like that, um, okay, there's just one, there's just one single place to check from time to time in addition to bug trackers. Okay, that's painful, but still better than the current state, which is uh, no bugs get forwarded or, or few bugs don't get forwarded. But um, yeah. Yeah, so, but that's, <laughs> but isn't that uh, what I talked about, about automated packaging for CPAN? What this yeah, one? Yeah. Sorry, okay, so I didn't get. <laughs> well, maybe, maybe that is not something that um, we need to, it's not for us to solve in Debian, but that's, uh, something close to Debian could actually provide depth because um, depending on the, so I'm, I'm not really familiar with uh, Perl libraries, but depending on the, on the language, on the language, it might be much easier to use depth rather than uh, installing from source. And if you have a large infra infrastructure, uh, uh, you need some kind of um, packaging to deploy your software to uh, every machine. Uh, that's something that, uh, uh, well, if you, if you need to automate the building from source using uh, Puppet, for example, it tends to be, well, a bit, uh, a bit dirty and uh, error prone. Uh, so, so 
Yeah, I'm not sure it's that complicated actually. Our uh, autom our packaging tools are already working quite well. Uh, depending on the language, uh, if you take uh, Ruby Gems, for example, uh, it will just the, the generated uh, Debian package will already work for probably 80% uh, of cases. So maybe the 20, the last 20 percent are really hard, but uh, I don't think we are that far. Sure, but that's also uh, the point that if you have, a, if you use, if you, if you start a project by using a Debian-based stack, using Debian packages, and if you, if in the end uh, you have like five percent of your dependencies missing in Debian packages, uh, relying on uh, being able to stay with a well Debian plus auto-built packages uh, stack is much better than uh, having to to move to uh, a mix of uh, Debian and custom-built. Stuff and also that's um, if we if we provide something like that, it means that we kind of close the opportunity for tools like um, uh, RVM in the Ruby world that are just uh, rebuilding the inter Ruby interpreter from source. Because if we get people used to rebuilding from source, there's a risk that uh, it just goes down the stack. And in the end, uh, the tendency to completely replace distributions or only see distributions as a foundation on which you build. Uh, your custom um, compiled from source stack. Um, yeah. Yeah, well, I think there are two sides. First, uh, distributions are in a kind of difficult position because they try to work to meet uh, many different needs. For example, uh, well, booting with a lot of logging is something that many users actually uh, like uh, and uh, a need for their, da for, for, da for their daily work. 
it's true that for some other users, a booting without logging is also uh, uh, could be better. But I've, there are ways to do that. I mean, uh, I, I'm not sure what's the default in Debian currently, uh, <laughs> but. Uh, um, Yeah, but well, I, I must admit I don't know what's. Uh, I, I don't. I didn't. Yeah, but uh <laughs> and about uh, well, upgrades, failing, etc. That's uh, well, this it's, uh, that's a hard problem. I think we are working on it and making improvements on it. I don't think that's something that is uh, easy to solve. And well, it's mostly incremental uh, fixes to that, but. Uh, yeah. Well, well, because if we just try to copy what is already done, um, probably will fail. Uh, while distributions, well, uh, I think there are way things that uh, distributions could offer in that area regarding trust, for example, uh, that are much harder to that for others to offer. So we should probably be focusing on what what added value distributions could bring based on uh, our experience doing other things. Then uh, look at, um, uh, yeah, then, then just try to copy uh, what is already being done. But then it means, al it means also that uh, a lot of people are uh, okay with uh, compromising in the other direction. Uh, if there, well, there are some solutions to run uh, 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 phones that are uh, free software based or more or less free software based. Uh, more or less is, is the important part of it. Um, and a lot of people are actually uh, looking forward to those solutions because uh, they would like to go in that direction and uh, uh, yeah, and, and are, are okay with losing some other functionality in exchange of uh, more trust. So, yeah. Other comments or questions? Thank you. No, time is up anyway. Right. <laughs>